possibly one of the most disgusting crimes we've ever covered on Dead Rabbit Radio. And then we take a trip to Jack London's house. Famous author, dead now, but people have been seeing his ghost for years. However, the ghosts that inhabit his property may have implications that go far beyond the death of an author. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. I'm still feeling kind of tired. Don't know if it's the medicine. Don't know if it's the lack of caffeine. Don't know if I'm still in recovery. But today's episode is going to be kind of short. Going to be a little shorty. Little tiny guy. But I wanted to put one out for you guys. So here we go. Now I'm going to start this off by saying that if you are eating chili right now, don't put it away. Well, actually, give it to me. Oh, man, I love chili. But give it to me, and then I'll eat it later. Because even I would not <laughs> dare to eat chili during this story. And just to be fair, probably don't eat anything. Nothing. Gogurt, fruit roll-up. You still might have a problem listening to this story. Let's hop in the Jason Jalopy. We are going to drive down to Los Angeles. The city of dreams. What's that song? da 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 Hollywood. And the New York Hills. Da, 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 da. What's that song? Dang it, it's by Huey Lewis in the news. You guys know that song? So we are headed to LA. I just edited out five minutes of me trying to remember Huey Lewis in the news song. So you're welcome, by the way. I gotta keep this episode short. The song was The Heart of Rock and Roll, if you were wondering. But anyways, we're headed to Los Angeles, the city of dreams. We're on Hollywood Boulevard. We're pulling up in the Jason Jalopy. We're looking for people to race. We have matching black leather jackets now that all on the back say Dead Rabbit Radio, which would actually be dope. You know what actually I would love to get is some Letterman jackets. I've always wanted to wear, I never wanted to wear a Letterman jacket as a teenager, but I want to wear one as an adult. I want to get one fitted for me as an adult. And just have some ridiculous stuff on the back. I don't know. A made-up sports league. Let- Letterman jackets are hilarious when adults wear them. I think it's just like the height of, I don't care anymore. I just, I really don't care what people think about me when a 40-year-old man, and you may say no, Jason, when a 40-year-old man, or 43 in my case, wears a Letterman's jacket, he's trying to relive his glory days. However, I will say this. If it is obvious that the Letterman's jacket is not his high school Letterman jacket, that it is one that he somehow scammed some high school supply company to make for him, that is the that is the sign of a man who just doesn't care. Who social engineers Jostens and is able to convince them to custom make him a Letterman jacket, that is not a guy trying to relive his glory days. That is a guy who's living his glory days right now. But anyways, so forget the leather jackets. We're wearing matching Letterman's jackets. And we get out of the car and we're all walking all studly. Now, we get, we're walking down Hollywood Boulevard and we see a Thai place. And I'm like, okay, guys, hold up. We're going to stay a far distance away from this. We, only, we just want to be passive observers. We don't want to be anywhere near this. And at that time, we see a young woman named Heidi Van Tassel. Leave the Thai restaurant. Bye, girls! Apparently she sounds like a 50-year-old housewife from a sitcom. Bye, girls! See you later! As her friends are all leaving the Thai restaurant, she gets into her car. She had a great meal. Everything was awesome. It was a girls' night out. But lurking in the shadows. And now we're switching to hobo vision. (sighs) There's a hobo hiding in the, the dark alley. The eyes, it's all target acquired, <laughs> target acquired. It's like infrared. He looks at her. He gets like her height and her weight. It's all target acquired. <laughs> and he starts running up the walls. <laughs> and so he jumps out of this darkened alleyway. And he's approaching this woman at rapid, rapid speeds. She's opening her car door. And the hobo, <sighs> the camel, he, t- he undoes his camouflage. <laughs> materializes behind her. Now... I'm going to read you this headline, because this might actually be the best constructed headline of all time. I'm a journalism, I'm a journalism dude, so my degree's in, this might be, I, I, this might be the best constructed headline ever made. Because the horror 
simply gets worse with each passing word. Here we go. Homeless man, which is not what you want. This is not how you want your headline to be. Because you know something bad's coming. Either it's something sad, homeless man dies. I guess some guy was shooting arrows at homeless people recently. But, so that's bad. But any article that starts with homeless man very rarely has a good ending to the headline. Homeless man threw huge bucket. So, right there. Now we know this does not have a happy ending. Homeless man threw huge bucket. You're like, okay, so a guy had a giant metal bucket and he chucks it at this woman, hits her in the back of the head. That would be much better than what's coming. Homeless man threw huge bucket of hot diarrhea. The whoever can start for this headline is a master of of the English arts. Because here's the thing. The, it's how often do you hear the words hot diarrhea to explain anything not in hyperbole? Oh man, this tastes like hot trash or hot diarrhea. This, oh man, it's, I'm so hot. I feel like I'm hot diarrhea. You never ever hear it used. Oh, dude, I just went to the bathroom. Oh, what happened? Oh, hot diarrhea, bro. Hot diarrhea. And even that, you would think, oh, did a bunch come out? Like, you wouldn't actually think that's a temperature gauge of the diarrhea. But we're not even done with this headline, with this horrific headline. Homeless man threw... (laughs) Homeless man threw huge bucket. And again, he had to say huge. It couldn't have just been homeless man throws hot diarrhea. And he he had to include the fact Not only was it a bucket, not only was it a bucket, it was an abnormally large bucket. It was huge. It wasn't just a little bucket. Homeless man threw huge bucket of hot diarrhea all over woman's face. (laughs) Again, dude, the specifics of this. What a great headline. Because you could have just said, homeless man throws diarrhea on woman. But this author really wanted to build the visual. It's a huge bucket. It's hot diarrhea, by the way. It's hot. And not only does he throw it on the woman, he goes out of his way to get it into the woman's face. And here's, as much as I love that headline, there is one fact that could have made, could have added to make it super gross. Remember, all of these events took place outside of a Thai restaurant. So it's quite likely that this guy, this guy's <laughs> diarrhea was fueled by dumpster diving Thai food, which would have made it extremely pungent. But I'm still giving this headline an A+. Plus, greatest headline I've ever read. So let's go back to the actual crime. She's getting ready to get in her car. And <laughs> homeless man runs up behind her. Huge bucket, holding it with both hands. Throws it in her face. He does. He gets her right in the face. Here is her quote. Here's her quote, which is hilarious. Which, again, is hilarious. Sorry, Heidi. I'm sorry this happened to you. It was diarrhea. Hot liquid. I was soaked. Okay, that's gross. And then she has to add, and it was coming off my eyelashes and into my eyes. So, she doesn't say she got any in her, any in her mouth, but I'm assuming at that point... She's probably, she probably did, but the smell alone, ugh. And then, here's the next part of this quote, paramedics who came to treat me said there was so much of it that it looked like the man had been saving it up for a month. So it's not like this guy just went, ate some Thai food, had diarrhea in a bucket, saw an attractive woman walk by, throw it in her face. No, it was full. This was a full bucket of Thai food-enhanced diarrhea that he'd been holding for a month. Pooping it, go about his day pooping it, go about his day pooping it. And then he threw it on her. So this is, I mean, how many bowel movements do you have a day? Now add Thai food to that, plus being a homeless psychopath, which means you probably have more bowel movements, and then pouring that on somebody, and it being hot diarrhea. So anyways, he's arrested. His name is Jer Blessings. There's no blessing there. Jer Blessings. And, yeah, I know a stupid joke. Just deal with it. Jer Blessings. Now, he's been diagnosed with schizophrenic and psychotic disorders. No, duh. Did they they really need to bring a doctor out for that one? They're like, 
Uh, we've rested this man. He uh, saved his feces up for a month. Uh, it's it's hot diarrhea. Um, can we can we spend eighty thousand dollars of taxpayer money to find out what's wrong with this guy? And they're like, yeah, sure. I'll sit down with him for a while and do puzzles and ask him some questions. And then I will tell you what you already know. This guy has some mental problems. But anyways, he's diagnosed with schizophrenia and schizophrenic disorders and psychotic disorders. Now, let me get to the part of the story that I think this woman, Heidi, wants to have her cake and eat it too. Because on one hand, she has this quote where she says, he doesn't need jail time. He needs mental health care. I have empathy for him because he needs help. But that that may be true. He obviously needs help. But the thing is, is that, so the judge goes, yeah, you're right. He does need help. Let's not put him in jail. They put him in a residential facility for two months and then he left. So he's back on the street. Buckets, beware. If you ever see like a guy buying a bunch of buckets from Home Depot, run. It may be this man. I guess you shouldn't be afraid if you're like in Iowa or something like that. But you can't have it both ways. You can't. Well, then the, when I say she, then she goes on. There needs to be more victim counseling. She got a bunch of infections, by the way. This wasn't just hot poop and it's like gack from you can't do that on television. Like this, she got infections in her eyeballs and they tested positive. She tested positive for all these infectious diseases. And then every three months she has to get retested for a while. And I'll tell you why she needs to get retested. And this is the scary part. And they didn't really mention this. A lot of times there's blood and poop. Especially if you're a homeless person, a psychotic homeless person, it's probably more common. And you can easily get AIDS through your eyeball, and it doesn't show up right away. I'm sure they gave her... If you if you get sexually assaulted, you can go to the hospital and they have like an AIDS shot that they give you. It doesn't give you AIDS, it takes away the chances of... So, let's say that I got raped by a dude... And I could run to the ER and go, I just got raped by this guy who was unprotected. I want the AIDS shot. Now, you can say, Jason, if you walk into a hospital saying that, they're going to think you were crazy. But it actually is a thing. They have like this instant injection they can give you that can cut down the chances of you actually catching HIV, AIDS, whatever you want to call it. So they that does exist. So I'm sure they gave that to her, but they're going to have to keep monitoring her because it's not 100%. And you don't know um, if you have it for a while. They say the first sign you have AIDS is you get the worst flu you've ever had. It's a couple weeks after the fact. Because your immune system's starting to act up. So this type of guy where he's... That's a biological attack. If he had thrown acid on her, he would have been in jail. Regardless of his mental illness. But he, he may have done just as much damage if she gets a horrible infection and dies from it. Moral of the story is, don't live in L.A., don't trust people who have buckets. I would say don't go to Thai food restaurants with black, like, long, dark corners around the restaurant. All those things. But I will offer this mystery up to you guys. If Scooby has the Scooby gang, what do we have? Do we have the rabbit gang? That sounds lame. Well, anyways, think about it. That's your first challenge. Come up with the name of a gang that we all belong to with our Letterman jackets. My challenge to you is, apparently, there is footage of this attack that the police is not releasing. Now, I don't want you guys to break into police servers and steal body cam footage. However, one of the local businesses recorded this on their cameras. So that's not... Again, I'm not asking you to, oh, don't break into the police station, but break into this boutique. No. If you guys happen to find this footage, because I know it's out there somewhere, diarrheaattack.mov, If you guys happen to find this footage, go ahead, post it on YouTube, and send it online. Actually, you should send it to Heidi first, because she wants a copy of that footage. But I would be interested to learn more about this story, about Jer. Really, what I want to know is how big the bucket was. Really, how big the bucket was. Because I'm picturing it like a big, like, not like a 10-gallon bucket, like a paint bucket. I'm picturing it like a metal pail that you could carry around. But I could be lowballing it. It could have actually been like a straight up giant, one of those old timey things they used to deliver milk in. That it was like his personal porta potty. And then one day he's like, ah, whatever. It's ports on somebody. And just to remind you guys, he's still out there right now. So you could be sitting here listening to this podcast. You don't know it, but there's hobo vision behind you. <sighs> and then you hear a sp- that's the diarrhea floating around in the bucket and you're like 
It's weird. I hear the sound of of corn and liquid being sloshed around in a tin pan. And then right when you turn around, <sighs> throws it all over you. Let's go ahead and move on to our next. That segment took 20 minutes to record. Let's go ahead and move on to our next story. I enjoyed it, though. Let's go ahead and move on to our next story. So we just saw all that happen. And you're like, dude, shouldn't we help clean her off? And I was like, no, no, no. We can't attract the attention of Jer Blessings. Like, just get back in the Jason Jalopy. We're going to drive out of here. So I'm starting the car up. And then we look we look in the rearview mirror. And we see the homeless person. <sighs> look at us. He's already lo- he's already hit his one target. He starts running. He's running towards the car. I'm like, come on, car, start, start. <laughs> I'm rolling down your window. I'm like, dude, get him, get him. I'm too important to get pooped on. I'm still trying to start the car. <sighs> Jer is he's running on all fours now. He's getting closer to the car. We finally started. <clears throat> he's still chasing the car. He's chasing the car like the T-1000. Dun, 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 dun. He's liquid diarrhea. He's turning. He can make his arms turn into like diarrhea blades. He's all slashed in the back of the car. Ah! Anyways, I make a quick jackknife so he gets some diarrhea on you. And I'm like, <laughs> we drive off. And then he's like shaking his fist at us. However, we there's a little bit of liquid diarrhea in the car. So it's like reforming into a little jar. So we throw him out. And then we take you to the hospital to get tested for biological infections. But luckily, you're clear. It didn't get in your eyes. It only got up your nostril and into your mouth. So be thankful. We're now in Sonoma County, California. We're going to a little place called Jack London Village. Jack London, I know that he wrote books about dogs, like Call of the Wild and White Fang and Cannery Row, which didn't have dogs in it, but it should have. Maybe the dogs, maybe they were canning dog food. I don't know. I know nothing about Jack London. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there who are Jack London fans that are like, there's so many other great stories you can tell about him, but he's dead. And so we're going to talk about him being a ghost. So apparently, he wanted to build this big old house Fire broke out, raised the house, and then I think it did eventually get built or raised again, but the other spelling. But anyways, he dies, and his wife said that she would see Jack Lennon's ghost walking around the property, and it gave her a sense of peace. And she saw his ghost with the ghost of the little puppy who passed away. This place, Jack Lennon Village, and then there's like a Jack Lennon State Park, and there's this house called like the Wolf House. It's kind of this, because he was a big deal. I'm really underselling him if you're not familiar with who Jack London is. Jack London was basically, for lack of a better comparison, the J.K. Rowling of that era. Like, everything was Jack London. Like, the biggest author of the time, I would say. To the point where still very famous today. So, I mean, I don't know who is contemporary. I know very little about Jack London, except that he was super famous. He wrote books that had cans in them, and wolves, and dogs, and the story about the reject. That's really all I know about him, but I also know he was, like, super, super famous. So, he has all this land that's kind of like a state park dedicated to him, little tourist stuff. You can go there. You can actually meet the Air Buddies. They'll play basketball for you. All this stuff. But there's also a lot of ghosts in this area. There's an old sawmill there, and what happened was after he passed away, other people kind of came into... Not necessarily possession of the property, but moved into the property and like had built stuff there or something like that. <laughs> Not entirely for sure how it hand because right now it's a state park. But when I was looking up the ghost stuff, it appeared that there were other people kind of not necessarily owning or operating stuff in that area, but simply existing there. So there was a passage of hands in this. And so when we start to see about the ghost stories here, it's interesting because a lot of times people see a ghost and they go, oh. <gasps> What does Jack London look like? And then they'd go and they'd look a picture of Jack London up there like, that's weird. That's not the ghost I saw. The ghost I saw was of somebody else. Because you you know that there's a ghost of Jack London. He's the most famous person in the area. And you're all, aw, I only saw a paranormal entity of some loser. I didn't even see a cool ghost. It's all lame-o. It's all blah. It's all super detailed phantasm. They're like, oh man, you're not famous. So anyways, you had this going on for a while where people were seeing ghosts that weren't Jack London. You're like, well, Jason, that's not that's not a story. Most ghosts aren't Jack London. And that's true. Most ghosts aren't Jack London. But things get even weirder here. One day this woman's driving down the road in the area. And she sees a man walking across the road in the middle of the night. And she's like, ah! 
And she starts to hit the brakes, and around that time, and other cars come in the opposite direction, and it hits the man, and the man passes through the car, disappears. So she goes home, she calls up her friend, she goes, what does Jack London look like? That's exactly what she asked him. And he described what Jack London looked like. She was in the area, she wasn't in Pittsburgh, she was in the area, I don't know if I made that clear when this part started. What does Jack London look like? And the guy described Jack London, she goes, that's weird, that's not who I saw, I saw a ghost of someone. Now, other people have said it could have been this other owner, because there had been sightings of an uh, of a owner after Jack London. Ghosts had been sighted in that area as well. And he's like, it may have been him, and described him, and she's like, eh, I don't know. But she decides to go back to this mill late at night in the area to see, she's curious about it, right? This is basically Daphne from Scooby-Doo, before she met the rest of the gang. She hops in her car, she drives back. And when she pulls up into the parking lot of this old abandoned mill, she sees a massive crowd of ghosts just milling about. Not one, not three, not four, a ton of them. Walking around the parking lot and in and out of the sawmill, just moving through the darkness. She describes them as dressed in all, all of them were all dressed in dark clothes. They had weird-looking eyes. Here's a quote. They had weird-looking eyes, deep sunken, with dark circles under them. Now, that sounds very torturous. That doesn't sound like a happy-go-lucky ghost. I mean, the black clothes, they could just been a bunch of emo kids. But the, like, sunken eyes and stuff like that, they, that's kind of a shorthand for, like, sullen or depressed and stuff like that. So, basically, these guys are less ghosts and more, like, phantoms. Kind of just moving through the darkness. Now, here's the thing. There's been a lot of theories that these characters, there's so many ghosts that have been, she cited all those ghosts, and there's been other sightings of ghosts that nobody can put their finger on. Well, obviously, they're ghosts, you can't touch them, but there's been sightings of Jack Lennon ghosts, there's been sighting of this previous owner's ghost, but then there's like 30 other ghosts people have run into, and they don't know who they are. They're just random dudes just hanging out. So, was Jack Lennon really a murderer of drifters? Was there a bunch of, like, miners who were killed in the area, not kids, cave people, in the area through some sort of collapse and nobody ever remembered it? Or was there, like, an old-timey plane crash that killed a bunch of dudes before planes were invented? Nobody knows. But there is a theory going around. And I've seen this theory pop up a couple different places. They're ghosts of characters from Jack London's books. Is basically Jack London's characters haunting the area now there's no wolves there's no ghost wolves as far as i know no spooky spooky ghost wolves but there the assumption is is that all of these ghosts may be characters from not necessarily the call of the wild which is a book about dogs but cannery row maybe maybe all these guys forgot how to get to work and they're waiting for a bus but then i was reading that i thought that's an interesting story and that's a, a cool little segment but then Something sparked in my head, and this is something I talked about just a couple episodes ago. And I've talked about it quite a few times, actually. But a couple episodes ago, I said, or maybe last episode, why are ghosts always dressed up in ball gowns? How come there are never any slob ghosts, ghosts walking around in underwear or naked? Because that's how most people die, or walking around in a, you know, Frankie says relax shirt, whatever. They're always dressed up. What if all ghosts are fictional characters? And what I mean by that is that when you think of Marie Antoinette or some old-timey knight dying or some uh, hot flapper chick from the 1920s who jumped out of a building or whatever, and then you hear these story, and I'm not talking about necessarily tulpas in this or that the ghosts are made up in her imaginary, but when let's go back to the Marie Antoinette thing because I think that one's, or Anne Boleyn, whatever, one of those old-timey people. When you think of them, if I ask you to picture Marie Antoinette, you're not going to picture her in bloomers with mustard all over her bare chest. Maybe if you got some weird kink, but you're mostly going to, I say picture, you're going to picture her in like a, a, in ball gowns, Elizabethan stuff. So she, that was only like 10 to 20% of her life. Most of the time she grew up, she's a little girl, she's running around in stupid little girl clothes. And then she spends a good amount of time taking dumps taking baths. She's not wearing her dresses all the time. But when we think of that person, the idealized, i.e. fictional representation of her is dressed up like that. Same thing. If you were a medieval knight 
how often were you actually in your armor? But you would hear the clanking of the knight's armor if you go to Edinburgh Castle at 3 a.m. You'll hear the armor clink. Well, he was never in the armor. I can almost guarantee that he wasn't walking around the castle in it. He only had the armor on when he was out killing Muslims in the Holy Land or bashing peasants' heads open with a mace. It's not, it wasn't, it wasn't casual Friday. Oh, I better put my armor on. I think this is an interesting thing. I, I think that, I'm not, dis- I'm not using this to discount the idea of ghosts or saying that all ghosts are tulpas, but you could have a ghost in an area that you, how you pictured that person in life is how that ghost appears. And what I'm basically saying here is that the ghost in the haunted castle, in Anne Boleyn's haunted castle, may not actually be Anne Boleyn. It could be something that you're transposing a fictional, a fictionalized identity on top of. So you're basically taking a blank slate spirit and putting something on top of it. Now, of course, you have people who say, well, the ghost has the personality of my grandpa, not Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn is not your grandpa, but your house is haunted by your grandpa. Every so often you smell cigarette smoke and you, you hear the, you hear the drink crack of a beer. I would still argue that that is the idealized version of your grandfather. Because you're not smelling his farts. You're not remembering that time that he got so drunk that he fell down and, like, broke the wood table. You're not sitting there watching Netflix, watching Slug Terror on Netflix because you have a bad taste in television show, and all of a sudden, your table, you hear the sound of a table being destroyed. You jump up and your table is perfectly fine. You remember the good stuff. And that's good that you remember the good stuff about your grandpa. But generally, the hauntings, basically all hauntings kind of fall into one of two categories. A, and most of them are this. A recording of an event, and generally it's idealized stuff about events. Or something totally malicious, and that's kind of like the small end of the scale. And let me finish it with this, because I'm just kind of throwing out this theory. But have we ever, excluding mediums who are ripping people off, have we ever had a ghost of somebody like Anne Boleyn? Which history knows quite well. But you have a ghost of Anne Boleyn. She's walking through her castle. And I'm using Anne Boleyn as just an example. I don't know if her ghost is reported on record. I'm just using her an example as a ghost and a historical figure. Has there ever been an exam- has there ever been a story of a ghost haunting a location of a known historical figure and then the ghost revealing information about said figure that was unknown before that has that ever happened because if it does if the ghost is able to reveal something that we didn't previously not know about Anne Boleyn then that ghost is most likely Anne Boleyn But if it's simply a parody of how we see Anne Boleyn acting, then it's most likely not Anne Boleyn. The ghost of Anne Boleyn, or the ghost of these historical figures, whether they're famous or not, kind of walking through and making these old-timey noises, are how we picture those characters. And how we picture those characters, in a way, is very fictional. The person itself might have existed, but the representation we have of them, it's the same thing like this. A lot of times when people do impressions of Donald Trump or Barack Obama or uh, George Bush, they're doing an impression of somebody else doing the impression. And and you get used to hearing that. So then when you do hear the original person, you're like, oh, yeah, he does kind of sound like himself. But we do that all the time. We do impressions of impressions because we think the impression's funny and then we copy that impression. I'm saying that that's what this ghost thing is is that it's a fictionalized version placed on top. It's a fictionalized idea placed on top of something else. So all of these ghosts walking around Jack London's backyard may be characters from his book that were so realized and brought to life through his writing, which I never read, that they've entered our world. They could be just spirits out there that when people look at, they're thinking, oh, that... Looks like characters from Cannery Row. And then they become characters from Cannery Row. It may just be a phenomenon that we're placing something on top of because of the location of what's going on. But, 
I will end it with this. I'm going to leave a cliffhanger for tomorrow's episode. Because I did say, has there ever been a case where a historical figure has revealed information about themselves after they died that we did not know beforehand? I do have a story. These characters weren't famous historical figures. But some people believe that their ghosts are revealing information about themselves now that they've passed. Tomorrow we are going to look at the phenomenon of queer ghost hunters. A group of ghost hunters who make it their mission to only find LGBT ghosts and get them to come out from beyond the grave. But we'll talk about that tomorrow on Dead Rabbit Radio. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be our email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.